Aloha and welcome to episode 35 of That Time I Got Arrested. We're getting old, you guys, but um, no wrinkles yet. And we look good for our age, honestly. I need to tell you about a friend of mine. He's real sweet and real cute online. His name is Mike O'Keefe. He has a podcast called Buddy of the Groom. I was on it. You should listen to my episode and nobody else's. No, I'm just kidding. You should listen to all of them, but really just mine, but all, all of them. He's funny. He's great. Check him out. Uh, Kristen and Chris, I just want to say thank you so much for hitting me up all the time and being really great people and friends and listeners. Sorry, I had to add that last one, but that's how we met. So whatever. Um, I have been getting a lot of questions from you guys recently, and I wanted to take some time to answer them really quick so that nobody ever asked me this question again. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, (laughs) So um, I had someone ask me, you know, how much of these episodes are scripted and I just have to say none, (laughs) none at all. So what I'll really do when I record is I will tell the whole story to my producer, Aaron. We'll talk it out. I'll take a couple of notes, like bullet points that I have to hit. But this isn't really like, you know, a show in the sense where, yes, I would like to be entertaining and hopefully that comes across. But also it's more like, I'm just remembering what happened. So there's really nothing easier in the world to do. And it's like all of this stuff has been like weighing on me for a long time you know these are all of my secrets like that's real so this is not scripted and um you know someone else wanted to know how long I had been practicing my particular vocal fry and the answer is I mean I guess my whole life because this is how I talk this is like my real voice I'm not putting on a show in the sense where I'm not like doing a voice for the podcast. This is just how I sound. And I honestly missed a flourishing career as a phone sex operator. And you know what? I might get into that someday. So stay tuned. Also, um, I know some people were kind of like, what do you mean you want to do nothing (laughs) in Colin's episode? And the thing about doing nothing is that... My life has been hard and I'm tired. And like, I really just want to get high and have sex all day. And that was like the thing that I didn't say to Colin because I don't really know him like that. And I didn't want to embarrass myself or make him feel uncomfortable. But like, I just want to get high and have sex all day. So um, slide into my DMs, give me a five-star review, write a review on iTunes. What are you doing? I mean, why haven't you done that yet? It's like rude, honestly. Do you want to help me? Like, are we even friends? Do you even care about this at all? Fuck, dude, write a review. Write a goddamn review. And uh, follow me on social media. Be Casper on Instagram. That time I got arrested on Instagram. Tell me your story. That time I got arrested at gmail.com. Write a review before I really get mad about it for real. And like, what if I just stop? You know, I'm going to stop. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to (laughs) stop. I love you. My name is B. Casper, and my entire life has been a lie. That's not even my real name. But don't worry, I'm going to tell you all of my secrets. This isn't the story of how I became an orphan. This isn't the story about how I jumped off a five-story building and survived. This isn't about how I died and came back funny. This is that time I got arrested. So I've really got to say that whole self-care, like self-love bullshit movement is fucking fucked. You know what I mean? Like good luck doing that when you're depressed, when you're dealing with trauma. You know, it's like my favorite word on this show. When you're low, you know, when shit's hard, when everything's fucked up, like good luck practicing self-care. Like self-care in and of itself is an act that only someone who has like the wherewithal and the ability and the privilege to be able to do all of those things, you know, is capable of doing when they're like not 
at their lowest point. So what I really want to talk about right now is something that maybe is like obvious, but also maybe not. I don't know. You'll see. I think that it's important for not only you and me, but like the people around you, especially, is to just like love you where you're at. You know what I mean? Even if you're like at a really low point, even if you're making bad decisions, even if you're not sure how to get out of the fucked up situation that you're in, you really just have to like practice this, you know, (laughs) bullshit act of like, changing the way that you're looking at it. You know what I mean? Altering your perspective to let yourself believe the fact that even though everything couldn't get worse, it can always get worse, but even if you feel like nothing can get worse where you're at, just being like, yes, I love this. (laughs) Oh God, that sounds so much easier said than done, you know, just like, oh, if it was only that simple, just like, I love this. You know what I mean? If you just told yourself that like, you love this terrible shit that's going on, but it's not about loving the bad situations and it's not about loving like the bad choices. You have to keep trying every single minute of every single day to getting better. Like that part never ends, but it's sort of just like not loving or like working towards this idealized version of yourself or like this like healed version of yourself, you know, kind of just like letting yourself be a mess and like loving yourself like in, through and around that mess. So I'm going to talk about, oh God, I'm, I'm so sick of talking about how fucked up I am all the time. You know, it's like, oh, do you ever get any better? You know what I mean? Like, does anything ever get any better? Or like, do you ever like fucking get your shit together? And the answer is no. <laughs> like, no, dude, no. Like, I'm not better now. Like, if you hear me laugh or make fun of this shit or think that I think that it's a joke or, you know, like I'm trying to sound like I'm cool, like, A, I'm not cool, never have been, never will be. Don't even fucking give a fuck. You know what I mean? Like 10 people like an Instagram post that I spend a week on. I don't give a fuck about that, you know? It's just like, it's not, (sighs) being cool just like doesn't matter. So I know that I'm not cool and I know that none of this is great, but I really like... Honestly, genuinely, sometimes, not all the time, I really love myself. You know what I mean? And I work so hard to have this relationship with myself that makes me feel like it's okay. Like everything that I'm doing, even if it's not perfect, even if it's messy, even if I fuck up and make mistakes, even if I make the same mistake a hundred times, it's like I'm... It's okay because I can I can keep trying and I can just like love myself, you know, like while I'm making these mistakes. So I guess I'm so kind of a long-winded preamble to talk about a bunch of mistakes that I made a couple of years ago while I was on parole and I engaged in all of this risky behavior because I was fucked. I was so fucked in the head. I didn't know up from down and I was just going through the motions and I really needed to be in therapy and I really needed to do, I wish I was doing all of the stuff I'm doing now, like then, you know, I would be in such a different place now. It's like, I'm looking back and I'm like, fuck, like what took me so long to just take this whole thing seriously about making this space in my head and in my heart to like have this hurt go somewhere and like take this aggression and like channel it into something and like, you know, try and sort of like get over some of the stuff I never got over because I just never told anyone any of this stuff. You know, I just kind of kept it all in. And instead of dealing with it, I covered it up with all of this fucked up, all of this fucked up deviant behavior so I don't want, I don't want to tell you, <laughs> I, I don't want to tell anyone, but I, um, I just told my producer and he was really the first person to hear about all of this stuff since it happened, except in one part, you'll figure out. 
So I would just do a lot of drugs and I would just really have like a lot of risky sex. You know, I would kind of meet strangers at clubs and uh, mostly concerts that I would go to and I would take like party drugs, like especially ecstasy. I did a lot of Molly and sass and would just kind of um, want to feel really good. And I would be at these like electronic music shows and I would wear skimpy outfits and kind of just hit on anyone. I'd go to these shows alone and I would get fucked up and um, I would like find someone to take me home and have sex with me. So I met this girl at a gas lamp killer show and we were like rubbing ice cubes all over each other. And uh, she told me she was an artist and I told her I wanted her to take me home and like paint me like... <laughs> so dumb. I just thought it sounded like whimsical and kind of like romantic and um, silly. So we went back to her place uh, while we were rolling and it was really late. And I had told her that I like liked this like really rough, like kinky kind of sex. And, you know, I didn't know her. So it was like, we didn't understand each other's boundaries or like what the other person really wanted. And it just got really hard, like too fast. And even though I was with a woman, even though it was completely consensual, even though I was on fucking ecstasy, it was the worst, like one of the worst, the long list, you know, it wasn't even in like the top 10 worst but it was a terrible experience. You know, that was the first time that I was really like coming to terms with everything that had happened in a way where now it was like I was trying to hurt myself and even me trying to hurt myself like wasn't cutting it, you know, like it got too rough. I got really scared. And then there was this moment where when we were finished, I was like in her bathroom and I was just bawling my eyes out. I was like on the floor of the tub, just like sobbing, like acting like a psycho, like in this stranger's house at 4 a.m., like coming down from ecstasy. So you can just imagine how good I felt, you know, I had paint all over me and it had like shaved my armpits that morning and it stung the inside of my armpits because it was washing off in the water. And I just regretted everything about how I like got to that point And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't let go and like tell anyone about it. I just had to sort of take it as this other thing that was piled on top of like keeping me locked up with all of these secrets that were really starting to like eat away at me and like destroy me. You know, there was this other time where, you know, it wasn't like I would just destroy what. And you set some groundwork with like you're still on parole. Yeah. This risky behavior is constantly a threat to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, that's great. That's a good place to start this next part. <clears throat> so I'm still on parole at this point. I'm like maybe four or five months into parole. And every single choice that I'm making, every single like risky decision that I'm engaging in is just getting me one step closer to getting thrown back into prison. And that's like the worst thing that could ever happen to me, but I'm not doing anything to prevent that. And anything I'm like towing the line and trying to like take myself deeper into this hole. It's like, excuse me. (laughs) It's like, I don't know how to heal. So I'm just going to make everything worse. One time I missed the meeting with my parole officer just by a few minutes and he left before I could get there and he got really mad and told me that he was going to violate me and I got so scared that I went to a bar by myself and just got like blackout wasted in the city and I was wearing like a short skirt and like go-go boots like what the fuck (laughs) why (laughs) who And I was drinking these things called salted pretzel shots and then like chasing them with Coronas. Like, ugh, I started projectile vomiting in Lincoln Park in someone's like 
front yard and blacked out at that point and fell asleep in the grass in front of like a person's home and, you know, passed out for a couple of hours. I'm like so lucky that I didn't get arrested or raped or murdered, you know, like all of the above really. And I passed out until maybe like six or seven in the morning and just sort of um, like peeled myself off of the lawn, drove all the way back to the suburbs, met up with my parole officer and just basically had to, you know, trade my body for freedom. You know, the way that that happened was he started getting more and more forward with like what he wanted from me, you know, like he definitely wanted to fuck he definitely wanted me to initiate it. He couldn't rape me because I'm not in jail anymore, you know? And so like the rules on the street are a little bit different. So he's either got to like manipulate or blackmail me into it or I he just like hope that I'm like going to fuck him for fun. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what men really think like women want because you don't fucking know, you know? Um, I like want a puppy. Like I want a boy to buy me a puppy. Like I don't care about fucking you. Um, that's not true all the time. But uh, he started texting me on this burner phone and he would just ask me like stupid questions and, you know, say like, what are you wearing? Or like, send me a picture. Just like, I, I fucking, I knew what he wanted. You know what I mean? And I played along because I wanted to do drugs and I wanted to be able to get in trouble and I wanted to break the rules and I wanted him to let me do it, you know? So I like did, you know, whatever he said within reason, like I never fucked him and I never like met up with him to fuck him. But, you know, I definitely made it seem like I would. And during that time, I was also sort of playing him because at this point in my life, now I'm like figuring out how to really manipulate men into, you know, digging themselves their own grave. So I started screenshotting all of the texts that he would send me from this burner phone and saving this little folder of like blackmail potential in case... In case I don't even know what, you know, because I'm still letting him think that I'm like halfway going along with this. But at the same time, you know, I'm letting him watch me pee. I'm getting away with doing all these drugs. I'm having all of this really fucking fucked up sex. Like, oh, the sex got so bad and weird. I just like couldn't stop like fucking people in a really like demented and dark way. And it led me into some really scary situations. And it's like, I could not have sex with men. You know, I really couldn't even be around men. I didn't want a guy to touch me. I wanted to take drugs and like have the opposite of that experience. But like, even when I was with women, I really had to have them be violent with me for, I don't, I don't know. I don't, it's not like, I didn't enjoy it, but it's also not like I enjoyed it either. You know, it was just something that I like needed um, because of what had just happened and, you know, trying to figure out like where it wasn't really, it wasn't about pleasure, but it was about like where my like feelings of desire came from, you know, it's hard to explain. I don't know. Does this, does this resonate with anyone out there? Am I the only fucking freak that exists? I mean... All right, a girl, let her know. So I told you that I had a profile on FetLife and I met this one woman in particular who was a little bit older and she was very butch and, you know, seemed very aggressive, which is definitely something that I was looking for. So I made every wrong decision I could basically from the beginning all the way into the end. I met her in a parking lot of a place I didn't know. I got into her car and let her drive me to a place that I've never been. I went into her house and told her very plainly that she could do whatever she wanted to me. And then she led me into her basement, tied me up and told me that she was never going to let me leave and that she was going to do whatever she wanted to me forever. (laughs) And I was just like completely dead inside. Like I didn't even react. I think that it probably scared her like how calm I was, but she didn't understand what I had just been through. I told her that she could do whatever she wanted to me. And then she said, okay, um, 
let's go downstairs. That's where my bedroom is. So we walked down into her basement and it was really dark and I was walking in front of her and she told me to go right and push me into this room that was just complete concrete. It was like an unfinished basement room and there was a gym mat on the floor and she pushed me down onto the gym mat and she tied me up and she told me that she was going to do whatever she wanted to me and that she was going to do it forever. So at this point I'm like, oh, okay, I just got kidnapped. <laughs> I'm never leaving and she's probably going to kill me. And I just thought, you know, at that point, I was like, fine with it. I was like, good. You know, like I didn't even want to be alive anymore. You know, I really just was doing all of this stuff because I didn't know how to like go about killing myself yet. You know, I would definitely had the thought of like, I want to die. Like I don't want to live through you know, the experiences that I've had, like I don't have anything to live for. I just want this over. I want this existence over. Like there's been too much, like I've had enough. But so I think when that happened, I was like, oh, I don't even care. Like that's what I sort of was looking for. I was like waiting just to meet someone who was like, I'm just going to kill you, you know? I didn't have to do it myself. So I was completely calm and I think I probably scared her with how calm I was. I was just said, okay, that's fine but can you please not have anal sex with me? Because like, that's really hard for me. <laughs> Honestly, that's what I said. Cause I was just like, I uh, just like, don't put that huge dildo in my ass. Like I just, that's the one thing I'm like, I think I even said like, if you're going to do it, can you use a lot of lube? Like I was, I was that calm and specific with her in that moment. And if you like, don't, if you have any doubts with how calm I actually am, like check out the Paige Blair episode when she's like losing her goddamn mind. And I'm just like, no reaction. <laughs> Ugh, yeah. I mean, I still get stage fright when I do stand up, but that's like one of the very few things that honestly evokes any kind of reaction out of me as far as like giving me anxiety in, in that way. I just like don't have that component to my existence, but that's really dangerous because like those kind of people jump off buildings, you know? So she took my license out of my purse and took a picture of it. And she used a digital camera to film us having sex and then told me that if I told anyone about what she did, that she was, you know, going to put that video on the internet. And she eventually did let me go after a few hours and we had sex for a very long time. And, you know, it was not... <sighs> I don't know. It's like, I don't, I put myself there. So it's like, is it, was that rape? Or like, I, I had an orgasm. Was that rape? But like, I, I didn't want that. Was that rape? <laughs> so now I'm putting myself in situations where like, I don't even know if I'm getting raped. Like, I don't even know, but I'm like putting myself in these situations. So she lets me go. I put on my clothes we get back in her car. She drives me back to my car. And on the drive, she's like, so you're my girlfriend now, right? And I was just like, yeah, whatever, totally. And she was like, so you want to like, she, she asked me if I had like plans for Christmas or something. And I was like, no, like, let's hang out. <laughs> I was just like, whatever you want to hear, bitch, like, that's fine. Um, and so then I like, like got in my car and, and drove home to my grandparents' house. And I, you know, I didn't even stop like doing what I was doing. I, I was just getting started, honestly. But um, what ended up happening is that woman did that several more times with other people. And one person that she did that with like really did freak out and like ran out of the house, like completely naked, ended up getting picked up by the police. The police ended up going to this woman's house and searching her house and finding that camera, which happened to have a picture of my license on it. So what eventually ended up happening is the police called my grandparents' house and told them what happened and asked them to get a hold of me because they wanted me to testify against this woman who, by the way, for two weeks after I saw her, sent me messages about how she had STDs, about how she was going to post my video on the internet, about how she wanted to hang out. She just went on and on and on and she just tortured me until finally she gave up, you know, or maybe she got arrested. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But the police contacted my grandparents and Ugh, I, you know, I wasn't going to testify. I said, no, thanks. And um, my grandparents freaked out, you know, 
they were just like, you're doing what? We thought you were a nanny. <laughs> they're like, you know, they're like, you were where? We thought you were with Hannah. And they got so pissed that they kicked me out of their house. And now my parole site has to change. I ended up moving in with my cousin. And, you know, because I had this like weird pseudo sexual flirty relationship with my parole officer, even though that could have been like really fucking bad. I mean, it takes months to like change your parole site. It's a whole fucking process and it's not something you can just do overnight. And if you like disappear, you have to like call a 800 number that's open 24 hours a day and let them know if you're going somewhere else. But because I had this weird relationship with him, I just was able to like dip out and, you know, didn't change any of my behavior didn't get any better, just had to drive farther to work. And, you know, definitely, definitely didn't lead me down any like, you know, paths of redemption or, you know, lightness. It's really only, only like a step away from going back to prison now. Only like, I'm just making all of the same mistakes in a way that is going to be bad. You know, I'm just like coming up to my next destruction. So stay tuned. Bon voyage. <laughs>